Welcome to Verify in Fields, the Millwork Podcast. Your host, Jacob Edmond, CEO of Duckworks, will be interviewing experts in the industry to bring you insights and knowledge about the latest trends, techniques, and challenges in millwork. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the world of millwork. Here's Jacob. We have Ezra Dressman today on Verifying Field. Thank you for joining us, Ezra. And today we're going to talk about a little bit about his background. He's a wood veneer expert working for uh, selling wood veneer. And we want to talk about his background. And then let's just talk about veneer in the millwork industry. So thanks for joining us. And if you could give us a little bit about just your background and how you got to where you are today in the industry. Jacob, thank you so much. So first of all, how I got here is truly by accident. When I about, gosh, I got married probably 15, 16 years ago. And one of the things I discovered when you get married is you actually have to make a living. Yeah. And so I ended up taking a job with a startup company. And so I first day on the job, they said, listen, we want to pay you to create, write content for a website. And I said, Sure. I don't, I can, I went to college, I got a degree, but I'm like, I can write. And so I started writing and on the second day of the job, they said, Hey, listen, we want you to write, but we also need you to create the actual websites and then market the actual websites. And I said, I don't know how to do that. And they said, that's okay. All you have to do is Google HTML for dummy <laughs> and you'll learn it. And so I Googled HTML for dummies and I didn't know what it was talking about. So I had to Google HTML for children. <laughs> and the reason I tell that story is because I really learned the same way once, once I started in the veneer world is when I got my job selling sheet veneer, I had no idea what sheet veneer or anything was. I'm not a woodworker. I'm always upfront with every woodworker and every customer. I'm not a woodworker. I don't pretend to be. I know my product and I try to know my product pretty well because I have to be an asset. I'm really an extension to them. And veneer is a weird product that not a ton of people know about. And as woodworkers will tell you, it's a finicky product. All wood breathes, all it expands, it contracts. And so that's how I learned veneer. I Googled what is wood veneer because I didn't want to show up on day one and not have any idea what the product was. And that's how I started. Okay. And I assume from there, there was a path and a series of events that led you to actually selling veneer, right? Was that, first of all, was that first startup? Was that a veneer business or what were they? No. no. It was no. Total, it was a marketing, I think it was clean energy okay. and green products but what it taught me was the black and white and bear down what internet marketing was and it has served me a tremendous amount because it that's when i started when i reached out after that job had taken a course i reached out to all my contacts and i said hey you know what looking for a new opportunity and so someone reached out and said hey why don't you come in for an interview and I said, sure, absolutely. He goes, yeah, we sell wood veneer sheets. And I said, okay. And then I Googled it, came up with wood veneer sheets and found out that the number one thing that wood veneer is not, and most people think is when most people hear wood veneer, they think, oh, flooring. And I'm like, no, wood veneer is anything, in fact, anything but flooring, anything flat, uh, and that can be walls, risers, anything flat and straight. That's what wood veneer ends up going on to. It's decorative and uh, not so much functional. The MDF is functional. The plywood is functional. The pario board is functional, but the actual face of the veneer is not. I did that for about six, seven years. And then from there, I went to GL Veneer, uh, which is a custom plywood manufacturer. They also sell big, huge live edge slabs, and they also sell sheet veneer. And then from there, after past three years, I took a job with selling for hardwoods locally by me in Detroit. And that is, that's me in a nutshell. And you never really know 
where life takes you and where the opportunities take you and but you roll with them because it's life and you have no choice frankly yeah so now in your role as selling veneer marketing veneer and selling veneer mm -hmm. to who are what is largely your customer base or what are the different categories maybe that your customers fall into sure obviously you have your retail sheet veneer where you got the weekend guys who say, you know what? I want to create a cool table. And they're one set of people. You also have your cabinet makers who use veneer day in and day out. And those and cabinet makers are split into two different categories. They're the guys who work with laminate and veneer is considered a, another type of laminate to them which is fine. And then you have the guys who work specifically with veneer and they'll press it on with either a hot press or cold press it on there. And they've been doing veneer probably longer than I've been alive. And then you have the big OEM shops and specialty shops. And those are the three to four categories. And obviously you have your distributors, which I love my distributors because as much as, as you go around the world of wood, I started off selling mostly to the retail end. We deal with end users, architects, designers, small cabinet shops, and you work your way up. And distributors, they work with the, not necessarily the mom and pop shops, but some of the bigger shops where each salesperson finds their niche. Some people love architects and designers. Some people love dealing with large shops. Some people love dealing with small shops and some love selling through distribution. And so you navigate where you're comfortable with and what you're good at. And those are the different people who buy it. Everyone uses it. Some people use it more. Some people use it less. But it's one of those, the ones who use it less are the ones that when you've been selling one product for almost, gosh, 12, 13 years, I think my daughter now probably knows at least half as much as what I know because she always hears me on the phone giving advice and how to apply it, what it is, how to troubleshoot, because you cannot be experts in everything. Right. And in fact, woodworkers who, who are experts in lots of different things and getting out of jams and all that stuff to be experts in a product that sometimes they might use only once a year or once every two years. In what you, your most recent experience and what you're selling, I want to explain for people who maybe aren't super familiar with veneer or maybe they think they are, but they don't really know how extensive the different types of ways you buy it are. So you've got, ultimately, the veneer gets cut into flitches initially. And there's different types of cuts, right? You could have rotary cut, right, which you're going to get big sheets for cheaper plywood and stuff like that. But then you are you selling those flitches as, or are you mostly selling the stitched together sheets to, or is it both? Sure. Listen, good question. And so we'll start with the, the veneer, what I call the veneer 101. Most, I would say most people, even guys who sell it, mm -hmm. who are used to working with, with veneer, most people think of veneer as a rotary cut type of product where you take the log, you soak it, and then they take it on a lathe and they, for lack of a better comparison, like a toilet paper roll. Yeah. They say and it just, and you skin it. There are really only two, I, God, I, there, there might only be a handful of people, lumber yards or mills left in the country that cut rotary veneer. Right. And so the amount of rotary veneer cut is actually very small. If I had to put a number, it's probably only 10% of, 10 of the market is rotary. And with that, it's only maybe maple, birch, and for every once in a while. Those are the three species that are cut that way. The other general two cuts is a, what's called a plain slice or flat cut yep. and a quarter. So the quarter day is basically you cut the log in, into quarters. Mm -hmm. It's then cut and create a very linear grain pattern along the length of the tree. The plain sawn gives you a cathedral type of look. And depending on the tree, so big trees, the rule is big trees make wide flitches and leaves. Yep. 
small trees like birch, maple, and others give smaller leaves and smaller flitches. And then from there, it goes to a place like GL, where they will match them together. Mm -hmm. They're in what's called a book match. So it opens up and the pattern is booked. Yep. Or a slip match where the pattern is slipped. And depending on the species, I'm covering my face, but depending on the species, really, it might make sense to get a slip. And sometimes it might make sense to put it like that. Yep. And to make sure it's pleasing and it looks correct. The goal of when it gets to a sheet veneer with a paperback or a wood back on it, any time, really any veneer that you're buying, I'll back up. We'll go before we get to the paper. Yep. A raw veneer gets sent to a veneer manufacturer. So some of the A, the B and the C's will get sent to big guys like Columbia Forest Products, and they will make the plywood that that most woodworkers think about when they're buying a CB or a C plus or a C4, whatever it is. When they're buying from Columbia, they're making faces, in, they're gluing all of the things into a four by eight, yep. generally speaking, face. And they're gluing that face onto a substrate, well, be it MDF, particle board, or plywood. Right. When it comes to specialty veneer, Let's say you're doing a huge, we'll call it a hotel entrance. And you want the veneer left to right, up and down, even the door to look perfect. You are not going to go to Columbia Forest Products. And I love Columbia Forest Products. They do a great job. You're not going to go and give Columbia Forest Products your specifications and say, hey, we want you to create this wall panel. Because they would just say no. Right. That's not what they do. You go to a specialty plywood manufacturer and they'll take and they'll, you give them the takeoff and they'll create the panels that you then obviously trim if you have to put edge banding on it and they'll send you a finished product. You obviously have to put your finish on it and install it. Yep. Then, yeah. Go so I want to r- take a step back for our listeners. Yeah because I think we're going to dive really deep here for a little bit. First, I want to clarify, you were explaining about book match, slip match. And first, I want to explain to everybody, we said a couple terms, one being flitch. So a flitch, if you think about, we first talked about rotary cut, so that's like a toilet paper roll. All of the other ones, and 90% of what we're going to talk about going forward, which is custom ordered veneer for the architectural woodwork industry. So made to order, that's all going to be basically anything but rotary cut. So rotary cut is a lot of what you're going to see if you go to the box stores and you get a sheet of plywood. At least one of those faces is properly rotary cut, if not like plain slice or something of a cheaper cut of wood. So in millwork, in the woodworking industry, when you order veneer or there are shops that make do this process their own, you're getting what's called a flitch, which if you think of a single log, that say it's plain sliced, like meaning they're going to literally just cut it like you see cutting slabs, but very thin into veneers. And so that single log becomes, think of it like a deck of cards. Yeah. So like a book. So that is called a flitch. And most veneer providers, right, or mills, they're going to give that a number to identify it. And the reason is you might, a lot of these jobs, you might even have an architect go and specify, I want that log, that flitch number, right? They're saying, I've looked at with the veneer provider and, but even if they don't, that gives us the ability, gives the veneer provider the ability to book match, architectural blueprint match a whole wall, for example. So like you were starting to explain, for veneer to be matched, meaning I want to look across a whole wall of wall panels, for example, and it to match up left to like this veneer all came from the same tree is what it actually means. But whether you're slip matching or book matching, you're taking that deck of cards. So let's first say book matching. And imagine if you take a deck of cards and you flip the first card over, open like a book, that those two cards are now book matched. And if you think of that from a veneer standpoint, from a log, the grain is mirrored. So those two first sheets of veneer, those flitches of veneer leaves, 
you're gonna have to correct some of my terminology. Those two leaves like match almost identically because it's so thin. When you cut them, those faces that were touching each other is what you're seeing, and that grain matches. And when you sequence that across the long wall from left to the, each two individually next to each other match perfectly, basically. And so it looks like you've now arrayed this across. Now, slip match, imagine if you take those two cards, instead of flipping one over, you just slide it over and put them next to each other. That is slip match. And the sequence part of it is that in the order they were cut, you put those leaves next to each other across. So just to make sure everybody can visualize people who maybe listen to this and aren't watching the video version, those concepts are a basis for everything we're gonna talk about with veneer. And you get some then end matching and things, but it, basically when we're talking about sequencing. And so another misconception I want you to talk about a little bit before we go further into the architectural right. is there's a lot of people that are maybe hobby woodworkers or even serious woodworkers, but the most common thing I, here when I talk to even friends that get into woodworking is then they start saying, oh, real woodworking is hardwood and anything that's veneer is cheap Ikea grade type furniture, right? That's a very common misconception is veneer equals cheap or fake. Talk about that a little bit. All right. It's probably the number one, gosh, you go and talk to anyone. They're like, oh, you sell veneer. That's the fake stuff. I'm like, no, <laughs> the technical most veneer is cut from a log that is, a, they cut it at approximately 1 seconds of an inch, which is approximately 0 0.02, 0 0.01. So 0 0.01 inches, it's thin. So one of the things that in ancient Egypt, I, one of the things I discovered is one of the oldest professions in the world is working with veneer. Most people think of the other oldest profession, it's not that. But veneer is the, one of the oldest professions in the world that started in ancient Egypt, where when you are working with trees and you are building, there is a natural hindrance to make sure that you don't want to run out of trees. We learned that in America. If you want to build a table out of something, you don't want to use a big solid two by fours. And the reason is for multiple reasons. Number one, there's a practical, you don't want to run out of trees. So veneer has been around for particularly millenn- the high quality trees, the high quality. Oh, it's shoot. I mean, you're talking trees that a uh, uh, walnut tree, let's say a slab costs a few thousand bucks. You're one inch of a really nice walnut tree. You can get 42 cuts from there. So one of the things that they discovered is you can get the look and the beauty of what walnut is. And it is this spectacular tree. But you don't want to waste it, right? Most woodworkers and most people want to conserve. conserve. And so veneer is the ultimate conservation product. You get 42 cuts within one inch. You get the best part of it What they do is they take the log. If the log is not straight enough, it can't make veneer because veneer has to be super straight. So they take the creme de la creme. They take the 1% of every tree that's cut and they make it into veneer. Then they will cut it into the strips and then they'll glue it together. So veneer is anything but fake. If anything, it is the finest of the finest wood because only the 1% gets cut. And then from there, only half that might only make it into the fine veneer because if it's got a hole, if it's got a defect, if it's got whatever the case is, then it becomes what we consider a nice sheet of veneer. So when you're buying veneer, particularly paperbacked or woodbacked or a finer grade of veneer, you're already getting the special of the special, the finest of the finest. And so it's anything but fake. And it allowed more versatility. So for example, that woodworker was doing it on the weekends. And they say, well, why don't I just buy some two by four lumber of walnut and I'll make my table out of it. First of all, that's fine. But then you also have to deal with practical expansion and contraction of lumber. Veneer does not, obviously, veneer, because it's veneer, it's really thin. It has to be applied to a substrate. 
it's usually applied to a plywood, MDF, or particle board, and therefore creates a stronger substrate and a stronger bond and less movement. So most tables, in particular tables, I use that as an example because that, that highlights how not fake it is. I'm sitting here at my dining room table because I happen to love it and it's made out of, it's made out of mahogany and it's pretty. But the substrate is MDF. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's real mahogany. It's real. It's they're real wood. They're real pieces of tree. And so it is by far the most common misconception. And yeah, I, I, a lot of people will like that, for example, they'll see a table and a lot of newer woodworkers or hobbyist woodworkers who maybe don't do it in a professional setting will see that. Say, oh, it's an MDF core. It's a cheap table. Right. And that is so far from the truth. And it excludes so many things. If you've been in a lot of times, you might even see a really nice piece of furniture. And this goes back centuries where you'll see yep. what's called like sketch face or something where you might see a circle table and it has got a very beautiful veneer inlay that looks like a pie cut maybe. But what you don't realize is that the only way to really accomplish that is with a veneer. Even if it's over hardwood, whatever the core is, to get that, that matching, you have to cut it so thin because if you have a thick board and you're, you're that matching totally, it doesn't work the same way. But two, for the balancing and the dimensional stability, you need a table. You want your table to stay flat. So if you notice tables that are made out of hardwood, a lot of times they do like the breadboard ends. That is literally to combat the nature, natural tendency of those boards to warp and to flex and to move. But it's ultimately a losing battle, depending, especially where you live. So having veneer. And having like an MDF or particle board, which to remind everybody, those are wood. They're just wood re-glued back together in a stable. You're using the bonding of the glue and stuff to make it more stable. In commercial architecture, this is why it's funny is guys, and I see even cabinet makers argue still today, residential cabinet makers will say, oh, I will never make my cabinets out of anything but face frame and plywood. And I have architects even in the commercial industry who will still specify plywood. A lot of plywood is less dimensionally stable than a lot MDF of most, and particle board. Most, yeah. And that most of it you think. for that reason, because plywood, particle board, and MDF are flat, stable, particularly particle board is lighter than MDF. And so when you're doing, like we, we started talking about, maybe you, you go into a hotel lobby and you've got a whole wall of wall panels. Those are not hard wood. Those are veneer on a core, usually particle board or MDF. And that is the only way to get that look, which is less common today, but even 20 years ago, like monumental millwork, you go to any bank lobby, any big skyscraper, any big high end, everything was veneer from the seventies through the nineties and two thousands, really it's becoming, honestly, today you've got like the Chipotle's that are covered floor to ceiling in rotary cut maple. But that industrial look is becoming more, we did a lot of Microsoft's actually, their offices are that way, but by and large, that veneer. And so it's funny to me when you, you the difference between smaller woodworkers, residential and high-end commercial. In the commercial industry, everybody knows we deal with cores and veneer all day, every day. And that's very common, but I don't think people realize that, that it's because it's actually a superior product for those purposes. Oh, completely. It's a matter of stability is, as a woodworker, as a sales guy, the number one thing you always fear as a sales and mill worker is I, once you deliver a product, that's the only time, you know, you want to deliver it and move on to the next project, right? You don't want to have to go back in there and say, oh, shoot, you never want those phone calls. And that's why veneer, we was cross banded and I'm going to talk with my hands yeah. <laughs> first. So I apologize for anyone now watching, but veneer is cross banded to the substrate. MDF is probably the ideal substrate because it is dead flat. It's flat. It doesn't move. And therefore, it counteracts the movement of any wood that is going on to the face. And it's obviously backed with something that is the same thickness and ideally the same species. And so that way, the core is as non-moving as possible. So when it goes up, you only have to put it up once. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that, the different types of compositions of veneer. So in 
in the millwork world, there are a tiny s subset of mill workers, and I've worked for a few of them that will stitch their own veneers. But, sure. Right? So they will buy that flitch just straight from a provider, maybe like GL or like Dogie or right? one of those people, right, that are the distributors, right? So they'll buy a log and they, but whether they do it or the mill does it or the veneer provider does it, what they're actually doing is they're taking those flitches and to the customer specifications, slip match, balance match, whatever, right? They're stitching them together. And that, what that means is they're actually going through a process where they're essentially taping and gluing those individual leafs into a large sheet, right? That's like the first step. But at that stage, you are not cross-banded yet, I assume, right? Depending on how it's being done. But you, if you just have a single leaf, it is actually a very fragile material because all of your grain goes the direction the tree grows, right? And so it's very easy to split. So talking about the composition, once they're stitched together, you are either putting paper back or maybe a three ply or something. What are the options of what happens next? Sure. So the goal, the goal is to make a sandwich, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the bread in some ways that is, it's really the opposite of a sandwich because the bread is the most complicated part. The veneer is by far the most fragile. Yep. You get, imagine you have a six inch leaf by eight foot length and you're taking those and you're putting it almost into what looks like a sewing machine many times. Yep. And they glue that one forty second edge and they glue them together. Sorry, I just had a visual. I don't know if yeah. you know that Mickey Mouse clip where he's slicing bread. And I don't know what movie it was from where it's he's slicing bread so thin because they're super poor. And he's it's like a little, that's what I just visualized when you said making a sandwich oh. out of veneer. It is literally that thin, paper thin that oh. we're talking about. Right? Paper thin, 0.02, 0.01 inches. It's a standard 140 seconds of an inch. And y'all can take your calculators and figure out what that is. Yep. But it's thin. And so it's thin. And so what they do is on a standard, let's say a four foot by eight foot panel, which is the, the standard MDF plywood panel, they will create each six inch and then you 12, 18 and so on. You get the 48, 49 inches and you have a full four foot by eight foot sheet of veneer. It's raw. All it is is glued together. And in order to stabilize it, you have a few options. And the options are chosen primarily by what you are using it for. If, it's, if you're creating a custom panel, then that face goes right to the press. And it is laid out onto the panel, whatever the panel is. I don't care what the core is. That's number one. So no backer, no sandwich, just the correct, veneer correct. stitched together to the core. To the core. And then obviously the core needs, you got to put two, two, two pieces of bread, yep. ideally the same thickness because otherwise yep. your balance is off. But that is how panels are generally made. That's option number one. Now, so that, that applies, Jacob, to whether it's done at a custom mill workshop yep. that does it themselves. Yep or at a veneer shop that we're doing it for them. So if those custom veneer shops that stitch their own veneer in-house, that's 90% of what they're doing. They're stitching Correct. them together, putting it on a, a panel. Or if, and this is most mill workers, if they're ordering panels pre-made yep. to order, that's what they're getting, right? That is what they're getting. Okay, the next options is when shops are ordering veneer that they want to press on a core themselves. And that's where it gets a little, there's a couple more steps, I assume, whether you're going to get a paperback or something. Sure. There are some shops that will buy uh, the huge, like much bigger shops will take and buy those four foot by eight foot. I will call them the faces. Yep. And they'll buy, they might buy a thousand faces at a time and then lay them up themselves. Right. Specialty shop, not a ton of guys out there. Right. That do that. Most guys, let's say you're doing, let's say you, let's say you did a bunch of work in a hotel lobby and the reception desk is curved. Yep. So you bought a bunch of panels and that's how the panels are made. That's fine. Then that reception desk 
you look at it and you say, I've got a curved piece of plywood here. Well, <laughs> how, how am I going to cover this? So that is where paperback and woodback veneer comes into play. So what happens is we'll take, let's say that four foot by eight foot face of walnut mm -hmm. and they will put and glue it to a piece of, I mean, it's a specialty paper made for veneer. It's impregnated with glue and you heat it and it bonds to that face. So then you have the 142nd of an inch thick face. Mm -hmm. You have approximately the paper backer, which is 0.01 inches. And so it gives you approximately 0.02 inches of thickness total. Right. And that is then used by the woodworker. It's rolled up and shipped off via UPS, FedEx, whatever the case is. And that woodworker unrolls it and uh, we can get into letting it climatize or whatever. <laughs> and that is applied. We usually, if you're buying a 10 mil back, you're applying it with a hot glue or a white glue, a PVA type of glue. Right. For those woodworkers who aren't comfortable or just don't have the experience using a PVA glue, there's also the option of same 42nd of an inch face. The face is all almost always the same thickness. And you, they'll put a an akume or a whole piece backer on it, which is also about a 40, 42nd of an inch thick, a little thicker, not much thicker, still rolls the same. They cross band it, that backer to it. Mm -hmm. The paper, you don't have to cross band because of the paper. Yep. But the backer is cross banded, therefore creating a solid, non fluctuating type of material, which is then applied with usually contact cement in the field or in the shop. Because, like I said earlier, a lot of guys don't have the experience. Yeah. And so you're in a pinch and you've got deadlines, you got customers, you got to get that. In contact cement, these days is the go-to glue. Yeah. Is it ideal? No, but but it's by it, and large it is what it is. whatever I mean, you use. And just so everybody knows, contact cement, you'll see a lot in laminate shops where, but it's able to be applied because you basically spray it on both services, let them tack up, and then you glue and roll it and press it, and you're essentially done. You're not, it is not bonded like a hot glue where you're going to have it press and dry, or you're going to even use a pinch roller or something. A lot of shops will do it because of the speed. Hey, I can spray it, glue it, press it, go. Or apply it in the field, like you said. And two, I want to touch, make sure everybody understands. So the backer that we're talking about in both cases covers a couple, accomplishes a couple of things. One, it gives you stability of the veneer for just transport. Literally, like you said, you're going to roll it up. If you did that with just the edge glued flitches, that would most likely split, crack, break because you just have the grain of and so the paper backer gives you a solid back that like you maybe you could tear it but is not going to tear break on its own and cross banding is when you take like that akumi another type of wood or, or another veneer and you turn the grain perpendicular to the face grain which is the same way plywood's made right and those cross banding when they're alternating it's like creating a woven cloth that those adhere to each other and help it to not split and crack. And one of the things that people need to understand is when they're getting a sheet of veneer, paperback or woodback, there are two processes that happen before they get it. Once the paper is on there, it will go through what's called a flexor, which basically breaks the grain of the face of the veneer in order for it to be flexible. It's literally what it does. It breaks that grain. So it keeps the look. The length wise, breaks, I assume, right? Yeah. But breaks the grain so that way it can be rolled. And then the second one is sanded. So you do not really have to do a bunch of sanding when you get it. It's an almost finished product. You might have to do a light, light sand, mm -hmm. but it's a finished product that all you have to do is glue to the substrate. And you're done. You put your finish on it and you're done. It's 
it takes a manufacturing step that in the olden days, maybe 20, 30 years ago, the reason people use their own veneer and they didn't, the idea of paperback and woodbacks veneer, they, the fact that you could buy it off the shelf is a new sort of deal. Right. So it, it takes that manufacturing step out of your hands and into someone else. And so you're buying a finished product. Right. And man. So pivoting a little bit. So we've talked a lot about, and, and hopefully educated our listeners a, a bit on veneer, people who aren't super familiar. Now, the majority of your customer base, the majority of buyers are, I would assume, informed buyers. Like they know, and they're buying this stuff day in and day out. You're giving me a face like that, that may be not true. And are there maybe partially informed buyers. They know sure. what they're buying, but talk a little bit about that, the customer base. What are there any certain misconceptions that you're often having to combat or educate people on? What is it that you're finding that people aren't educated about that you're working against? I would say the number one, let's say sheet veneer in particular, mm -hmm. right? We'll zero in on that because it's the most retail type of product. Right. And not everyone uses it. It really, it's not, so there are two options, right? If let's say you're a woodworker mm -hmm. and you're given two options, let's say option A, a 10 mil, four foot by eight foot sheet of veneer costs 80 bucks, let's say. And the same sheet, the same face of veneer with a wood backer might cost 90 bucks or 95 bucks, whatever the, whatever it is. So woodworker end user says, Hey, you know what? I love you, Ezra. I'd rather get the $80 one because I have to buy 10 of these sheets. And frankly, we're all working on margin, right? Right. I get it. We're all working on margin. So they see the cost difference and they say, what is the practical difference? And this is probably the number one, the number one issue of every woodworker who works with veneer is they see the cost and they see, they know the face is the same. Yeah. They will. Why, why should I bother paying the extra 10 bucks for the wood when all I could, if I could just use a 10 mil. Yep. If you've worked with 10 mil and you're working with a hot press or a PVA glue, go for it, go for it, save the money. Don't spend the money. It's fine. Yep. If you're a woodworker that is only using contact cement or the guys in your shop are just, they're laminate guys. They, they don't do it all day long. Yep. They want to treat it like laminate, give them the ability to succeed because if you use contact cement with a 10 mil backer, the off-gassing of the contact cement will cause havoc and bubble and all of the things that everyone has had happen to them. Every single war. Yes. I don't care who you are, unless you've never had it happen in your... I saw it actually this week on a, I'm a member of some Facebook groups that are smaller woodworkers and the cabinet makers posted a picture of, hey, I've got these veneer cabinets and I've got bubbles now. The client called me back. It was most likely a paper backer that they contact them at. Yeah. And it's partly because it's not as poor, it's not able to like breathe, but it's also a thinner service. And if you don't sure. like a hot press, you're able to press it, let it adhere. So the process of gluing affects it as well as, like you said, the off-gassing is trapped in there, I assume, versus yeah. the wood back, it can breathe more. It can breathe more and it can stabilize. It's more stable, yeah. It's more stable. And it's a matter of, you might pay a little more mm -hmm. up front, but in the long term, you won't have the callback. You won't have the issues. You'll be quick. You'll be done and you'll spend less time in the shop putting it on. It's not a matter of cost. It's a matter of what is the right product mm -hmm. or the application. That's all it is. Take a step back. And that's really the way to look at it. And no, well, I've been in this industry for 10, 12 years now. No one's getting rich selling wood. We're all, it's one of the reasons I love the industry is you work with guys who are working hard to make a living and then they go home to their families to play with their kids, take the dog out. And that's all of us. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting the right product for what they're making. And that's the number one thing that we all love doing. At least I do. It's fun. Yeah. It should be fun. Awesome. So uh, shifting gears a little bit again, something yeah. that I think is unique 
maybe exclusively to veneer, but it is like you, you touched on it, it's a natural material, but also particularly yep. in the commercial industry and in the design industry, it's something that is largely specified by the client or the designer, not the woodworker, right? So most of like your clients are coming to you looking for something that was dictated to them. Hey, I want flex on, I want rift cut oak. I want whatever this is, right? They have a specific or, hey, the architect saw this somewhere and they want that. The reality yep. is though, whatever they saw doesn't exist because it's a natural material to some extent, right? They can get something that's very close. And so you then, a lot of times you're having to say, okay, yes, we have walnut or we have flats on walnut, but that's where the idea of an architect or designer going and picking a log is like, hey, I want, it's just like picking stone, I guess is pretty similar, right? Hey, I want that yeah. slab because I like the way the veining is that. Similar with wood, right? It is alive and every, no two trees are alike. Talk, is that a, something coming up a lot of, hey, we want this, can I find that? So the answer is totally, and I'm, and I'm going to burst a lot of woodworkers' bubbles here because as a veneer sales guy, I have two, I really have two customers. My customer is the woodworker, mm -hmm. but when it comes to architects and designers, my other customer is not necessarily the architect or designer. It's the raw veneer salesperson. And I'll give you an example. So a lot of times I will get a drawing, an architectural drawing, and the veneer will say, ah, it's a walnut veneer made by XYZ company. Mm -hmm. Anytime, so my, some of my best friends in the industry are those XYZ veneer people. And the reason I, number one, I like them, but number two, I need them to like me because sometimes they get a good job and they want to give to someone they trust. If the XYZ company is worried that you're always going to try and swap it out, then they're going to lose money. And so, yeah. To make sure everybody, I'm on the same page and our listeners are on the same page. I'm just going to throw a name out there that kind of comes to mind. Dogie veneers. So sure. an architect says, I want this made by Dogie, for example. Correct. Dogie, for people who may not know, is somebody that you can go and buy a flitch, a log, or something from, right? But like right. Geo Veneer or some other Indiana architectural plywood, or somebody might buy those leaves from them to make into plywood. Right. So what you're saying is you might have a woodworker who buys their veneer from you, and they're working with a client who has specified a log from another company. And you need to get that log, not just walnut. I need right. that log. Is that right? Correct. And yeah, that's correct. And listen, there's a want of every business owner, frankly, to make the most amount of profit mm -hmm. for what you're making. That's admirable. Everyone's got to do it. We all do. When it comes to some of those specified logs, my goal is always to get that log at the price that I can sell it at. Right. I'm never going to be the guy to help you get around not using that specification. Right. Because um, there are people out there, that's what they're going to do. Say, hey, I can value engineer well, this and get you some. This is cheaper. It's worth it to make it look a little different. It's close enough. Right. Or there's actually people there that are probably trying to pull one over. Oh, yeah, I got you what you wanted, but it's actually something different. I saved half the cost. Yeah. And so I don't play games. And that's why I said I have two customers. And in some ways, I'd rather lose a woodworker customer than the relationship with a, a vendor. Right. Because that vendor is infinitely uh, more important. And I say that not to be mean or whatever. The architectural world is a small world. And everyone knows that I don't want to deal with Ezra. If they're not going to deal with Ezra, if they know that Ezra is going to work around them. Right. And so that's, that's probably like the number one thing that happens in it. Listen, Jacob, you probably deal with it just as much as me mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. No, I think that's important context for people to understand. There's a couple of parties, several parties here involved in this. And two, to understand how, I think a lot of people have the, an idea of like supply chain and products and everything seems so like mass produced and standardized and veneer is something that just to some extent, isn't and can't be. There are 
products coming out, like reconstituted and things where they're like man-made, basically versions of veneer and stuff. But by and large, it is still, hey, I get a type of tree and I get a tree that looks a certain way, just like stone. Hey, that tree is only grown in one place and only one person can have that tree to sell it at any given time and then it's gone. And a lot of what we're doing is is that specific, that custom, that detailed. And so that, that is a unique dynamic you explained there of, like you said, that vendor is important because they're, that's the product you're selling. Get from them. You have to be able to get it for future customers, not just that one. Okay. Is there anything that we haven't gotten to? We covered a lot of base, but I know there's a lot more we could cover. We could probably just cover several episodes in talking about veneer. I know there's, probably, I can, you, you can ask my daughter. I could talk about the year old. I know there's probably people listening that are probably like a lot of the experienced people in the industry that are just screaming at their screen with things we're saying, but we're trying to cover a lot of base in a very short amount of time and give people a good context. So is there anything we didn't cover that you think is important to share? So just because you mentioned it, I'll, that reconstituted veneer are, recon, in some ways, people think of reconstituted veneer as fake fake as well. And so what I'll say about it is it real wood. Yep. It is a real face. It's not, it's, they grind, generally speaking, they grind up a, I think they grind up. I'm blanking on the species that they grind up. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> they grind up, let's say they, they grind it up, they dye it, and then they reconstitute it into something that looks like, let's say, rift sawn oak. The reason you want to do that is because let's say you're doing that hotel lobby mm -hmm. and you don't want to worry about matching. Right. Every sheet is going to look the same and it's going to line up and therefore you're going to save a ton of money on that is reconstituted. They do make other fun, cool products and there's lots of neat product out there, but that is the general reconstituted thing. Listen, veneer is fun. It, I exist to to make your life easier because as you mentioned, we could go on for hours and hours talking about veneer. I don't expect the average woodworker. I don't expect, listen, and I know when there are people who know a thousand times more than me, mm -hmm. we're here to really learn from each other and lean on, lean on your sales guys. We're, we are here to help you because I, I wouldn't expect, uh, when I have an issue with my shingles. I'm going to go and walk to a roofer and pers a person who works with shingles and, and shutters and all of these things. When you have issues, go to the people who know the best. And that's like a lesson that my parents told me. Don't, you don't get smart by, by pretending to know everything. And I don't know everything, it's, but I know it here pretty well. Are there any trends that you see? Because this is also, a, some things stay the same. There are things that follow trends. Are there certain species or things that you're seeing becoming more popular or more common or is there anything as you started or following the things that have changed over the Smart. years what, what's happening these days listen unless you're living under a rock oak and walnut have been just crazy and with that there we're moving i would say i've seen a lot more pine uh starting to creep up really and uh, yeah so it's because frankly because of the living breathing tree they get sparse and so as they get sparse the cost goes up and art decks and designers will then specify something a little different yeah but oak and wall that is to, are still one and two or two and one right i don't think that's going to change over the next year or so when it, that i don't i gosh i hope it changes a little only just to let the forest breathe a little but i don't think that's going to change yep so there's two questions that I'd like to ask every guest. Uh, first one, what do you see changing over the next five to 10 years in the millwork industry? It's going to get a lot younger. It's going to get a lot younger and it's going to get a lot more technologically savvy. Mm -hmm. As unfortunately, either woodworkers retire or just move on, frankly. And I'm, listen, I'm 42 years old. I'm considered young in the industry, but I can tell you that people 10 years younger than me and 20 years younger than me, they're going to come into the industry. And frankly, what's nice is to see those young people come in 
but they also come with a different skill set because they grew up differently than you and me. Right. Like, I, I know what a cassette tape is. They don't. Right. But what that means is the technology that they already have in their brains are going to be installed into the industry. And it's will change the industry for good. It just It'll just change it. And so I think how the industry embraces those younger generations, uh, it'll be interesting. Awesome. I, I agree. I think it makes a lot of sense. So on the flip side, what do you see staying the same? Ooh. What do I see? I, business doesn't change. We, we still have to be overthinking. And maybe the answer is just the same is what's going to stay the same is you still need skill set. Those skill set and woodworking hasn't changed in 2000 years. Maybe some of the CNZs have, have made it a little easier, but the details on how to put together a box is, have not changed right. all that long. And it's to embrace the basics because in some ways a dying breed because as new technology will never replace how to build something. And maybe that's what chain stays the same. I, that's, it's a hell of a good, you've stumped me, which doesn't work. <laughs> awesome. awesome. I really appreciate you meeting with me today and taking time to talk about veneer. I know this is something that we could, like you said, we could talk about a lot longer. There's a lot more to dive into, but I hope we gave people a really good overview and some valuable knowledge today. If people want to reach out and connect with you, what's the best way for them to contact you to find out more about Ezra? Listen, they can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty, I'm young enough that I check my LinkedIn <laughs> fairly often. It's Ezra Drisman. Yep. And uh, start there. I could give you my cell phone number and you could spread it all over <laughs> the world. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk to anyone at any time. Yep. But I would say just reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to help. And, or, and if I can't help, at least steer them in the right direction. And the goal is to grow the industry. My, that's always been my focus. Yep. Awesome. I really appreciate you joining us today. And I look forward to maybe having you on again in the future. Yeah, Jacob, thank you so much. Thanks, Ezra. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do you want to stay up to date about industry insights, new content, and our community of mill workers? Go to duckworksmw.com to sign up for our newsletter. I'll see you in the next episode of Verify in Field. <laughs>